them online, and then there's all kinds of continuing education through the magazines and the journals that I read where I obtain information on how to maintain your presence in a courtroom. You work for the University Medical Center Hospital, is that correct? I am contracted with the hospital, yes ma'am. Um, and you work, should I say, through the Rose Heart Company, would that be accurate? Yes. Okay. Um, would it be unethical under your nursing duties to ever testi testify contrary to <coughs> your findings or lack of findings? Uh, what I mean, I guess that was a bad question, so let me reword it to you. You said that you're, an ob you're objective, you're a medical professional, is that correct? Yes, ma'am. Would it be unethical to your profession for you to ever deviate from what your true findings are? That would be unethical. It'd be the same thing as me trying to tell a patient which one of the options to pick. Ethics play heavily in what you do as a professional, as a registered nurse. You were asked some questions in regards to whether or not you met with the district attorneys. Uh, previous to you testifying, um, and you stated that you had uh, spoken to the district attorney over the phone. That was your testimony? Yes. Okay. Um, would you consider it normal or abnormal to speak with an attorney before you take a stand? That would be normal. At any point in time, uh, did myself or Mr. Stevens tell you what to say? No. You. We just talked a little bit about, you know, your job is to report uh, any findings that you may have found. My question to you is, is we talked a little bit yesterday about um, how the history of the assault that Ms. McAdee had given you, you were not expecting uh, to find traumatic findings to the vagina. That was your testimony yesterday, is that correct? Yes. In your nine years of doing sexual assault nurse examinations, in regards to patients of uh, Ms. McIndade's age, would you say that findings are quite rare in association with sexual assaults? Uh, I would say that I would have expected um, a person of her age with the history of the event that she gave that I would not have expected to find any injuries to her vagina based off of the history that she gave me and then based off of the clinical assessment that I did. Thank you so much. That concludes my presentation. Okay. Any recross? No, you're on. Thank you. Thank you, ma'am. I appreciate you coming back. Oh, oh hold on a second. I may have a hearing. Yep, sorry. Okay. Sorry. Council, come on up, please. Step up into the box and you're just push the box down, raise your right hand, face that gentleman right there. 
You solemnly swear the testimony you're about to give this action will be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth, self so God? Yes, I do. Thank you. You may be seated. Please state your complete name and spelling, both your first and last name for the record. My name is Elin, E L Y N N E, Green, G R E E N E. Thank you. May I proceed, John? Yes, go ahead. Thank you. Uh, Ms. Green, how are you employed? I'm with the Las Vegas Metropolitan Police Department. And what do you do with the Las Vegas Metropolitan Police Department? I am currently manager of victim services and human trafficking. What are your duties and responsibilities as the manager there? As a manager, I oversee the two units uh, for human trafficking and also for victim services. Plus, I provide direct service. I help with program development and community outreach. Okay. Um, prior to becoming the manager, did you have any um, prior employment before becoming the manager? Yes, I've, I've been with the department for 24 years, started as a victim advocate, was promoted in 2008 to supervisor of victim services. And in February of 2016, I became a manager. And you said you've been with Metro for 21 years? 24. 24, I apologize. Yes. Thank you. Prior to joining uh, Metro, did you have any training or experience? Yes, I've actually been working in the field since approximately 1974 um, as an advocate, as a clinical therapist, and um, in various supervisory positions. What type of education? educational background do you have? I have an undergraduate degree in psychology and a master's degree in the creative arts and counseling. And when did you obtain those degrees? Uh, my undergraduate degree was completed in 1979 and my master's degree in 1981. All right. um, other than your um, schooling education, do you have any other training? Yes, um, I've been receiving ongoing training. In fact, this year alone I've completed 36 hours of stalking and interpersonal violence training. Do you uh, teach any courses regarding your work? I do. I, I teach uh, in the police academy, the corrections academy, and I also teach out in the community as well as in-service training through the Las Vegas Metropolitan Police Department, and I've presented at both state and national conferences. And what are, uh, are those na national or state conferences related to domestic violence? Yes, interpersonal violence. You also said that you've worked with uh, victims, and I want to direct your attention more towards victims of domestic violence. About how many victims do you see on a regular basis? Um, currently, since taking the management position, I've reduced the numbers I work with between 50 and 75 new victims each month. So over your 24 career, you've seen hundreds if not thousands? Yes. You've testified in district court multiple times regarding domestic yes, violence? Yes, I have. Okay. Um, I want to draw your attention to this specific case. Um, have you ever spoken to an individual by the name of Christine McIndy? No, I have not. All right. And have you ever spoken to an individual by the name of Jonathan Copenhaver? No, I have not. Uh, do you know either one of them on any personal basis? No, I do not. Uh, do you know anything specific regarding uh, any sort of relationship between those two individuals? No, I do not. Okay. So I want to talk to you then more generally about domestic violence relationships. Um, how do, I guess, domestic violence relationships occur? What kind of, how does it start? The reality is that very few relationships actually start out abusive or violent. Um, there's very, very few people that engage in a relationship and um, initially they, they see the red flags and they stay in it thinking, gee, this person might ruin my life and, and make my life miserable. Instead, those red flags are often misinterpreted as signs of love, for example, um, constant phone calls to check in and see how you are. or um, constant little gifts, things like that, that later on it becomes reflective that maybe that person was exerting power and control or maybe that person was actually um, jealous or controlling or manipulative. But those, those are the things that people often misinterpret early on. So it does begin as a real relationship based on love, attraction, the normal things that happen Absolutely. in normal life. Okay. Um, 
you mentioned something that during that testimony there regarding this kind of power and control. What do you mean by that? Domestic violence, dom interpersonal violence, is basically based on power and control. There's different forms of abuse. It could be physical, emotional, sexual, financial. There's different types of abuse. And it's all about one person exerting power and control over another. How is it that people are able to exert that control over somebody else? That kind of goes to the question of why do people stay in abusive relationships, that being love. You start out a relationship feeling a connection to that person, so it's often very easy to um, excuse behaviors, take responsibility or blame for behaviors at some juncture, um, but there's always that hope. Hope springs eternal. So when the relationship starts out as one of love, that that emotion continues to build even when things become unsafe or unbalanced. Okay. This idea of them um, falling in love, do they, are they, can they still be in love even as the abuse is occurring then? Absolutely. Uh, it's, it's not uncommon for someone who is in a very dangerous situation to say, but I love that person. We hear that quite often. Um, I don't want that person to go to jail. I don't want that person to leave me. Um, I still love that person because, again, it goes to maybe things will change. Okay. Um, you mentioned how kind of the beginning of uh, relationships occur and specific domestic violence with gifts and those types of things. How does, once the abuse is commenced, what types of things may the abuser do in order to continue to exert that control? There, there, there's a whole um, power and control wheel, so to speak, where it kind of explains how there's tension building in a relationship, and then there's the explosion, whether it's the physical, emotional, sexual, um, or financial domination or abuse. And then it's what we call the hearts and flowers phase, where um, the abuser does everything in their power to, I'm sorry that this happened, there could be gifts, there could be much more passion. Many people describe that as the best part of the relationship during the hearts and flowers phase. Okay. And after this hearts and flowers phase, is there another round of the cycle? It's cyclical. And it's not a time thing like every week or every month. It is just a cyclical nature where the tension building then continues and so on and so forth. And is there any sort of standard that, it seems like you might have already answered this, but to clarify, is there any certain period of time then when this cycle restarts? For some it might be shorter than others? Absolutely. Some it could be daily. Others can say once a year. He hasn't hurt me in over a year. Okay. Um, <coughs> do abusers ever try to isolate the victim? That's part of the power and control, the isolation, because many times if if you have a close friend or a relative and you're concerned about them, whether it's their health or a relationship, you give them feedback. By isolating them, they lose that contact with the people that could say, something's not right here. And then the other part of that is the isolation is also about that control. The people around them are not giving them good advice. They're not good people. So that is how the abuse pattern continues. Okay. And is there any... Um way or uh, what have you seen in your training experience in ways that an abuser might try to isolate the victim? Uh, they can tell them that their family is not good for them. Uh, they may take them on, depending on uh, what the circumstances are, they could take them out of the community where they're living, where they have resources, take them away from things that are familiar. Um, and even just saying, I want to spend time with you. Why do you want to be with your friends? Why do you want to go out? Or even in some cases, we've seen people, um, they have no vehicle. The vehicle is disabled during the day, or they need to leave their job. There's a number of circumstances that occur that over time can isolate an individual. Okay. And um, are there, in your training experience, have you seen times where the abuser also uh, makes threats if that person reaches out to other people? Absolutely. If you call the police, if you tell anybody, you know, I didn't really mean this, but if you tell anybody, it's going to get worse. Or sometimes they threaten other family members or friends as well. All right. Um, I want to talk to you then a little bit, uh, now that we understand kind of how the dynamics of a domestic relationship generally can be, I want to talk to you um, more specifically than how a uh, victim in that relationship may react. And I'll start you off with this question here. 
Um, do victims of domestic violence immediately report the abuse? No, that is, that's one of the common, um, common factors is by the time someone reports abuse, there's often a very long history behind it. And they may not even be identifying all of the behaviors as being abusive until they really sit down and take an inventory of what's been going on. Okay. So uh, it sounds like then, if I'm understanding correctly, once an abuse uh, has been reported, potentially they would reveal additional abuse that's occurred previous? Yes. Uh, so if it's not common then for victims to immediately report the abuse, why is it that victims still feel, or why do they still stay with their abuser? Well, number one, again, is that emotional connection that victims have with the abuser, um, that, that feeling that if only something else happened or changed, the relationship could get better. Also shame. Um, in some cases, it's financial domination. There's so many factors that, that hold victims in unhealthy, unsafe environments. Okay. <clears throat> uh, and we, we've discussed this also. You've, you're kind of talking about this uh, roses and flowers period. Is that, you said that that's kind of one of the highs potentially in the relationship? Yes. Okay. And then I'm assuming then one of the lows would be the actual abuse itself. A combination of that tension building, knowing that, you know, I need, to, I need to be on my best behavior, I need to not do this, I need to be careful, I can see it. Um, people have sometimes even just a look lets you know what's coming. We all had that as children, where that one look when you walked in the door, you knew what was coming next, um, even though you kind of hoped. <laughs> it would not. <laughs> yeah, you didn't think your parents knew. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, <clears throat> So in your training and experience, how long can someone potentially live in a domestically violent relationship? I've worked with victims that have spent 40 to 50 years in, a, in an abusive relationship. Uh, in those experiences with the 40 to 50 years, um, do they eventually report it after those 40 to 50 years? Is that how you found out about it? or? Occasionally, they will get to that point because they've somehow had contact with someone else who you know, tells them this is not okay or something happens in their life that convinces them. The other thing is somebody else calls the police. And, and the police intervene and for the first time they don't say it was just an argument. Okay. I want to talk to you a little bit about once then the crime or the abuse has been reported. Um, what in your training experience, what is it that or how do victims react once it's actually been reported? Occasionally victims will feel a sense of relief. I get to tell my story, but many times they are, they're very torn emotionally. Again, going back to that connection, the emotional connection to the person, but there's also fear. Incredible fear of retaliation. What are people going to think? Will I be believed? Um, we hear that quite often that I didn't report it because I didn't think anyone would believe me. All right. Um, even after the abuse has been reported, is it common for the um, victim of the abuse to contact the abuser again? Yes. You see that quite often. We've even seen when someone's released from custody after a long period of time, as a result of the abuse, they reconnect. Again, it goes back. And what victims have described to me over time is, I believe that my, my partner realized what was wrong and, and we're going to work on it together. Or sometimes there's other connections that bring them back together. So there's again this idea of hope and change. Yes. Okay. Um, is it also common then for um, the abuser to potentially reach out to the victim again to rekindle a relationship? Yes. Why is it that the abuser reaches back out to the victim? It's again, it's about power and control. I'm in charge. I can get you back, even after everything that happened. Okay. Uh, in your training and experience, uh, have you ever dealt with victims who have been successful in um, distancing or leaving the relationship for a while where they then go back to that abuser? Yes, I have had cases where as, as long as 10 years have passed before that person reconnects, believing that things have changed um, and that they will be getting into a different type of relationship with that person. And does the victim believe that they've also changed during that 10-year distancing period? Absolutely. Victims often take responsibility. If only I had done this, if only I had done that, perhaps it wouldn't have escalated to this point. So they take responsibility. And again, that's part of the cycle of violence, 
is, is allowing that victim, even during Hearts and Flowers, to say, I'm sorry I hurt you, but if you had only not done this, this, and that, this wouldn't have happened. So part of the power and control dynamics would be kind of this guilt putting Shifting on. the blame. Better said than I did, thank you. Um, are you familiar with the term battered women syndrome? Yes. And can you explain to us what that is? That's actually a term that was used long, long ago, and we're kind of getting away from that. It's really post-traumatic stress syndrome. And basically what it is, again, going back to um, the victim becomes convinced that they're responsible for the abuse, that somehow they're causing the escalation, and they take on a lot more responsibility, and also just uh, the impact that it has on their life when they're dealing with the post-traumatic stress as a result of the abuse. They make bad decisions, they're, they may respond impulsively, things like that that go along with, with that behavior. In your training and experience, what, um, what do victims of abuse, um, do they do anything to try to hide the abuse? Absolutely. Um, the victims of abuse will cover up bruises and marks, they'll make up stories. I've heard some great stories about how people sustain the injuries that was not inflicted by their partner. Um, they will tell medical professionals stories about how it occurred, or they won't get medical treatment for those injuries if it's really obvious that they can't hide it. Um, they will also, again, even tell their friends, I started it, it was my fault. Okay. Um, have you seen cases where the um, victim becomes more introverted or stays more inside, doesn't go out in public as often? Yes, that's very common. And again, that's isolation because they're either embarrassed, they're afraid, they don't want to draw attention. There's so many reasons why people would withdraw to hide the abuse. Okay. I have a few more questions for you. Have you seen domestic violence cases where maybe um, the, the abuser and the victim are not necessarily in the same house all the time? Maybe it's a long distance type relationship. Have you seen those cases? Yes, we do see that quite a lot. Does that make it any easier, in your experience, for the victim to potentially report the abuse? No. Um, again, it goes back to maybe the neighbors hear it. Um, they hear something going on. But no, it doesn't change the dynamics. Okay. Um, what about um, abuse in, where the abuser and or victim are in some sort of celebrity or popular popularity status? Does that affect? Um, it, it does. We, we work with victims that either it's going to be a high profile case because of who they are or they perceive that it's high profile. So it, it could go either way and the, um, as a result people often they are afraid they're not going to be believed or that it's going to draw way too much attention and it's going to be bigger than life. They just want to avoid that publicity or they just want to avoid the, the input from the public. Um, would potential uh, disclosure of abuse, would that potentially affect um, their popularity or status? It, it absolutely could. It could um, diminish their popularity. It could um, call them into question. We have seen some very high profile cases where people question the victim um, and, and diminish the, the impact that the abuse would have had on them. If in, in those particular situations, uh, is it common for um, victims then to potentially recant or minimize some of that abuse? Recanting is very common regardless of, of the status of the relationship or the status of the individuals involved. Recanting is a very common way that victims try to pull back after telling their story initially. Okay. And will you uh, explain to us what recanting means? Recanting means, um, and we hear that quite often, where they will give details of what happened that night and then sometimes we will get called within the first 12 hours saying, no, 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 um, the police officer misunderstood. So they take back their story or it could be a month later where they go, well, actually, that's not really how it happened. You know, I was kind of fuzzy that night, so this is what I said, but didn't really mean it. So it's taking back the details that they originally conveyed. Okay. Um, if a victim of abuse is going to um, disclose the abuse, who do they most often report to first? Is it police officers? No. They're, they're often the last. Again, that's the, the only time that police officers are first is when it's somebody else calling 
because they're hearing something or they're concerned. Occasionally we get friends that will call. They will go to someone um, in their inner circle, whether it be a friend or generally not even a family member because there's such a strong emotional connection to that, but someone that they think that they could just vent to. Why is it that they don't initially contact police? Many times when the police are called to a scene, even by the victim themselves, it's not to arrest their partner, it's to make the bad behavior stop. That's, that's the number one reason that victims will call the police themselves. And once police are contacted, uh, at that point potential charges could potentially be filed. Yes, if a primary aggressor can be determined, then it is state law to file those charge, to press those charges, and it then gets submitted for consideration of prosecution. So again, that, that throws the victim into a whole new world trying to navigate the justice system. And can the justice system be complicated, particularly for victims of abuse? It is so complicated, and in all honesty, um, it can be unfair mm -hmm. to victims. And how can it be unfair? Um, victims often have a perception that if they are being victimized, that the outcome is going to be justice. And in their mind, it means someone's getting convicted and they're going away for a long time, and that doesn't necessarily happen. So because of that, uh, victims are often frightened. They feel like they just put themselves out there and now nothing's going to happen or they're not being believed. And then the other part of that is just the time the time that it takes to commit to that case. There's a lot of work on the part of the victim to show up for court, to put themselves out there, to, to talk to a room full of strangers. And that can be difficult? That's terrifying for victims. Uh, and, and the things that they testify to in court, um, we're talking about a relationship, is that, are those personal things to them? It's very personal, it's very intimate. And even if it was just a smack, sometimes the humiliation of having to say, I let this person smack me, or they smacked me and I didn't do anything. That, it could be enough to humiliate somebody. Of course, we're going to form of domestic violence, can it be a sexual abuse? Absolutely. Um, is part of the manipulation that's employed by the abuser um, kind of making the um, victim feel um, inadequate? Yes, that, that's also part of power and control, which then leads into the victim taking responsibility for some of the abuse or, or the things that make them uncomfortable in a relationship. Okay. Um, the I wanted to touch base again with you regarding the um, celebrity status of individuals. If the abuser uh, has some sort of celebrity status, does that also make the victim less likely to report? Oh, absolutely. It, again, they see that person as much more powerful. Why are they going to believe me? They're going to they're going to believe that person. Okay. One more moment here. Sure. I've got a poor memory, I apologize. Um, if the um, victim initially <clears throat> reports a, any sort of abuse, let's just say for, on social media, and if that individual is met with um, poor response, how would that affect um, a, another a future report. They're not going to want to. I mean, if we think about social media, it's a very powerful tool. Once you put it out there and people are reacting, going, you are so wrong, or it was your fault, or why are you doing this, you're not getting any support, you're probably going to be more, much more cautious the next time. Thank you. Cross? Thank you, Your Honor. Just one moment. 
Uh, how many times have you testified in court? Um, in district court here in Clark County, probably about oh, 25 to 40, oh, probably over the course of my career, close to 100 at this point. And of those, of those times you've testified, uh, how many have been as, as an expert witness? All of them. All of them. And of the times you've testified, how many have been for the uh, call by the defense and called by the prosecution? I've been called by the defense twice, once in federal court and once in district court. Did you receive any training or instruction in how to testify? I took a course uh, that was offered through the Attorney General's office uh, several years ago that just kind of talks about uh, behavior in the courtroom and things like that, and it was related to domestic violence. Where one of the things you were taught was while the prosecution was questioning you to look at the jury so you connect with them? No, it wasn't about, it was more about uh, specific information about domestic violence in the courtroom as, as an expert not to cross over into mental health, things like that. Okay. I noticed that during the prosecution's uh, questioning, you were asked a question and then looked toward the jury to give them an answer. Is that Correct. right? I'm going to just ask you um, some things related to domestic violence victims, and I want to know if this is consistent or inconsistent with um, what you've seen, and then I'm going to ask you beyond that whether it's typical. Okay, So that's where we're going. Um, do you find many domestic violence victims that cheat on their partners sexually? Um, there are histories of infidelity, but I don't always go into case history uh, with the victims. That may be something that's disclosed during an investigation, but that's, there is a history at times of infidelity on both parts. Common? Uh, I can't say it's common because, as I said, I don't necessarily go into that detail with a victim. Have you worked with any uh, victims involved in the so-called pornography or adult entertainment industry or so-called porn stars? Yes, I have. How many? Uh, I couldn't recount the number, but I've worked with quite a few over the years. We're in Las Vegas. There's a number of individuals that are involved in dancing or, uh, or other forms of adult entertainment. Plus, I also work with human trafficking. I guess I was asking with specific reference to movies. Um, yes, we have had, I've had several victims that I've worked with. I can't give an exact number. Again, some of that information may be disclosed during investigation, which I would not necessarily be involved with as an advocate. 
But as an advocate, wouldn't you typically understand what they did for a living or what their... They may or may not disclose that during our interaction. Isn't it important for you to know as an advocate whether this is someone that was sort of a, a shut-in in their house, locked in, not allowed to go out and see people, as opposed to someone that was a public persona making appearances? Um, just because someone's making public appearances doesn't necessarily mean that they're not isolated in their home. That, that, well. wasn't, that wasn't my question. My question was, isn't it important for you to know that? The answer is yes. However, um, again, just because someone describes being involved in a public realm doesn't mean they're not a shut-in. So there's two pieces to that. I understand that. You just, you've said that twice. Thank you. Um, is it fair to say that people who have been victims in the past, either sexual molest molestation as a kid, child abuse, or prior domestic violence, are more likely to be domestic violence victims, sort of, they call it, I think, perpetuating the cycle? We often see that in, in victimization, that there's a history that makes them more vulnerable. And I think you were asked a question about long distance relationships and that that could be consistent with domestic violence. Correct. And is that common in what you find that people live apart in different states, <coughs> see each other infrequently, yet it's a domestic yes. violence that's common? Uh, yes, um, it is, it's becoming more and more common probably over the last decade in my experience, uh, just because of the nature of of jobs and things like that, people working out of different states and connecting um, when they can, things like that. So we do see that, as well as couples that have children in common and are no longer living together but still maintain a relationship. Okay, so along those lines, one of the reasons it's fair to say that people stay together and don't report domestic violence is because of children. Is that fair to say? That's one reason, one of, of many, yes. I understand we're going there. Uh, one of the reasons is financial. Perhaps, yes. Okay. So you would say then it's as consistent for someone to be the breadwinner or dominant financial person yet still be a victim of domestic violence? We actually see quite a, a fair number of the breadwinner being the victim of domestic violence. And do you see in that the breadwinner um, sort of constantly throwing it in the face of the abuser over and over again that they don't make enough money, that they don't pay rent, things like that? Not necessarily, no, we don't. Is it common to see victims make a lot of public appearances on their own? Yes. Uh, and by public appearances, I mean in the media, on TV, um, webcasts, TV shows, uh, I'm sorry, uh, web TV shows? Uh, it's very likely um, for, for a lot of different dynamic reasons at this point, but um, I wouldn't say it is as typical because we're not always working with high profile victims that have access to that. But we're seeing a lot more people doing uh, YouTube videos and things like that as part of making money or um, sharing their philosophies or beliefs. That's becoming more socially acceptable than it was 10 or 15 years ago. Okay, but, you know, high profile outlets. Um, uh, TMZ, top, um, you know, MMA or, or um, fighting outlets, um, mainstream media, large mainstream media, uh, is that common that they're doing these appearances on their own? If that is their career base, absolutely. There would be no reason why they wouldn't, if, if they're continuing with their career during the abusive parts of the relationship, yes, they would continue. Even if these, uh, these appearances are out of town? Yes. And that would be consistent 
as I think you testified before, consistent with also being isolated <coughs> in a, and a shut-in at other times? Correct. And is it, is it uh, common or uncommon that the, let's say it's a male abuser and a female uh, victim, for the uh, male to be not jealous of, of her in any way? Uh, I couldn't answer that because again, that goes to um, what might come out in an investigation but not necessarily in my interactions with the victims. Did you, in connection with your testimony today, did you review anything with specific, that was specific to this case? No, I have not. Did you, without saying what it is or anything like that, did you see this case in the media or read anything about it? No, I have not. I, I don't follow the media, to be honest. But, um, so it's fair to say, sitting here today, you don't really have any idea who would be who Mr. Copenhaver or Ms. McEnday really are. Correct. As, as to who they are as people, did I ever hear anything in the media? Absolutely. You know, at some point in the past okay. when the initial abuse occurred, however, it wasn't something that I necessarily followed. I understand, but you know at least enough to know that this is a, a, a professional MMA fighter and a someone who is a professional or star in the adult uh, entertainment industry. I, I've seen some things about that. Have I confirmed it? No. Okay. So I, I think maybe what you're saying is you don't, you've heard it on the media, but you don't know Correct. whether it's true or not. Correct. Is it consistent with being a, a long-term domestic violence victim to seek out a relationship with someone who is violent for a living? There's a separation. No, that is not consistent. Um, violent for, I mean, boxing, any of that can be considered, any of the sports can be considered violent. Um, so someone seeking out someone, it's not necessarily because of the violence, but rather who they are as a person. And is it then, the corollary to that is, is it consistent to continually go to the media and talk about, how the victim go to the media and talk about how much they enjoy the violence? I couldn't answer that. Is it typical that the abuser will continually move out and leave the victim and the victim will continually ask him to move back in to get back together with her, assuming male victim, female victim, right. which I'm going to ask it to assume. Is assuming that what? A male uh, abuser and a female victim. You have the question in mind? Yes, I do. Okay. Um, and that is correct. We see it in both directions. Um, when people move apart, one tries to reconnect and bring the other one back in again, back to emotion. Is it typical that a domestic violence victim would have a history of joking about domestic violence and rape? I couldn't answer that either. Is it typical that a domestic violence victim would be the one who controlled the environment, decided where they went and, and how they appeared and, and what have you? Pro on a professional note? No, uh, both personal and professional. I really couldn't answer that completely. On a professional note, that's a possibility. Each case is unique and, and different, so I really couldn't answer that as a pervasive yes or no. One of the things abusers do is cut uh, victims off from their families and their friends. If, they're, if isolation is one of the techniques they're using, yes. So it would be inconsistent with isolation if 
the victim was consistently bringing the abuser to all types of parties with her friends and if, say, the abuser's mother lived with them, mother and her boyfriend lived with them in the same house? There's different ways to isolate victims from the resources that, and resources being the people that could give them feedback. So um, I can't say that it's inconsistent or consistent, but it's also not uncommon that they appear in public together and that even further um, creates that sort of dynamic where the victim is afraid that no one's gonna believe them. And is it consistent or inconsistent along those lines that the victim is, is permitted to hang out with her friends as much as she likes without the abuser? Again, depending on the, the way the power and control plays out in that relationship, it could also be that um, the abuser knows that victim is not going to share her story with those friends when she's interacting because she's fearful if it ever gets out. Well, what if the uh, abuser knows based on social media, uh, texting, other things, that in fact uh, not only has the victim shared the story with her friends, but it's a fairly regular thing that she, sh she shares the story with the public and with her friends. That's, that, that would be a lot more specific than I could answer in terms of domestic violence dynamics. You said one of the things uh, that was typical of domestic violence victims were that they feel trapped and can't get out? Emotionally, yes. And we also talked about uh, the abuser you know, on several times through the, uh, throughout the relationship, leaving <coughs> into a different state. Now, is that consistent with, um, with being trapped and can't get out? Correct. It, just as I said, when someone could be in custody for years for a domestic violence offense and then the couple reconnect, when that person gets out, they've been separated for a long period of time and then reconnect. And is it typical, hmm. well, let me say this kind of as a foundation. Um, let's say a victim has a, uh, a regular thing on Mondays where um, they put out a new picture of themselves on, you familiar with Instagram? You know what yes, it is? I am. Okay. Uh, a new picture on Instagram for something called Mac Mondays, and the abuser knows that there's going to be a new picture every week. Uh, is that consistent with this cycle of harmful violence that leaves marks? Again, that would be a very hard, because that's a very specific scenario, so that would be a difficult question for me to answer. Okay, I'm, I'm sorry to jump around, but my notes jump around a little bit. Uh, you go to national conventions as part of your training? Yes, I do. Have you ever taught at one of the national conventions? Yes, I have, for the National Organization for Victim Assistance, as well as several other organizations. And what were the topics that you taught on? I've talked, to, I've talked uh, specifically on uh, the issues relating to domestic violence, safety planning, lethality assessment, um, the intersection between domestic violence and exploitation, uh, sexual assault, <coughs> post-traumatic stress, relating to the victimology. All right, and these are things you talk about regularly with what we'll call Metro. I think I can use the word Metro, right? <laughs> um, not necessarily Metro, but with my, with my um, peers and with other people involved in the victim services field. Okay, so it's fair to say that these, these conventions are basically <coughs> what you just referred to as the victim services fields? Correct, but we do have multidisciplinary training. We receive training from law enforcement as to what uh, state laws are and interacting with victims so that we all, so our roles are seamless when we're working with victims. We work with, and we also train with prosecutors as well.
let me know if this is too specific for you, but is it consistent with the domestic violence victim that they give multiple media interviews saying how much they enjoy seeing the abuser get hurt, uh, just get hurt, get beat up? Again, that would be very specific to this case. Is it typical in, in these types of relationships, in fact, not to have a hearts and flowers face? Um, I have heard of that, um, but, but it's all relative. Uh, sometimes just, you know, simply coming home and saying, hey, I'm never going to hit you again, is the hearts and flowers face that a victim might describe versus, you know, being wined and dined or getting a gift or being told how much they're loved. Okay. Well, what if, is it typical then to see that there's no discussion of I'm never going to hit you again? No presents, no wine and dine. No, I, I think flower, roses are flowers, but we'll say flowers and roses. None of that at all. That's something you commonly see? Um, again, I, I wouldn't be certain of that because often victims' perceptions are very different of what that looks like for them. So I can't say whether that's typical or not. Have you worked with any victims that have what I'll call rape fantasies that they want played out by their abuser? I've worked with victims that have various um, sexual, um, whether it's sadomasochistic or bondage. Yes, we have worked with victims that have ultimately shared that they have an alternative lifestyle. And that would include perhaps having someone choke them either during sex or what have you, unconscious? Generally, um, what, what we find is that the delineation between where it becomes abuse versus a sexual fantasy or part of um, just the sexual history is that the safe word or that, that fine line that's predetermined is respected. And once it crosses to that, it becomes abuse. Okay. Well, they're choking someone unconscious. When they're unconscious, there can't be a safe word. So if it's requested that someone be choked unconscious, that's something you And that would be out of my purview to answer that. Fair enough. And um, if they've asked to be choked unconscious with multiple partners, multiple people throughout the, the years, that consistent with the victim abuser dynamic, or is that out of your purview? That would be out of my purview. And let me just see if I have this right. You said oftentimes domestic violence victims don't report the abuse until they sit down later and take inventory. And they Not go. often, but that is one way that victims, something happens in their life that makes them make that decision. They don't want to die or maybe at, at some point in their life something, an opportunity presents. Okay. And have you seen in your long an illustrious career, um, people who take that opportunity, the one you've just described, to create false prior incidences of domestic violence. I have not experienced that, but again, that may be determined at the investigative level beyond my contact with the victim. Okay, that would be that would be something typically they wouldn't reach you if that was the case. Not necessarily, but um, I have not had experience with them then creating a whole history that didn't exist. There's often, many times they have photographs put away that nobody knew about, or they have friends that will come forward and say, yeah, I do remember. It's not necessarily admissible in court because we can't put timelines to it, but they usually, there's people that know, and, we'll, and we see that in our domestic violence homicides, where someone goes, I knew it was going to happen because. Okay, so there's, it, it, but you're not saying that there's never anyone that makes this up for publicity, financial gain, things like that? 
I'm going to say no, I can't say that. However, it um, happens. It, yes. everything happens. However, um, that's putting people out there um, the same way that when we sometimes criticize people, you know, saying I don't believe that they were sexually assaulted. Once they've told those details and gone to certain lengths to get through this system, which can be convoluted and difficult, um, I, I, they're often pretty accurate. In all your years and all your hundreds or thousand people that you've uh, that you've had contact with, the victims that you've had contact with, you've never experienced anyone that was lying about it, making it up. I have had, but that usually pans out very quickly, um, where they indicate a motive, um, whether it be custody of a child. It 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 come it becomes very clear very quickly. Is it uh, common in your, your experience that domestic violence victims will post pictures of their injuries on Twitter? It's probably becoming a lot more common just because social media is becoming a lot more common. Um, again, I, I'm not connected with the victims that I work with on social media, so I couldn't verify that, but I would suspect that that is very likely. Now, it's, it's your job to help and advocate for victims, correct? Correct. Is it typical in your uh, experience that people are, or a, a victim, again, female, continually texting naked pictures of herself to the abuser? It's very possible, just depending on the juncture of the relationship and when those pictures are being sent. And, and again, um, can I say it's typical? No, just because this is pretty specific. All right. <clears throat> um, with respect to isolation, Prior to, if prior to a an abusive relationship, the person is you've heard the term homebody. Mm -hmm. Yeah. If the person is a homebody to begin with, um, does that play into an opinion of isolation? No, not necessarily. Often, when we get into relationships, people tend to take on the characteristics of their partner. So, if their partner is spending a lot of time out in public they may very well change their pattern of behavior. Not always comfortable, but they may do that as part of the relationship. And if they don't change to accommodate the partner, is that common? I couldn't common? answer that. Is it common or uncommon for um, a domestic violence victim to begin picking fights with the abuser? Actually, that's part of the cycle of violence. We often hear that, that during the tension building phase, as the sense of escalation is starting to happen, the victim may, at some point when they're aware of the fact that this is now an abusive relationship, let's get it over with. And they do the one thing that pushes that person's button. That's a very common thing that we see in abusive relationships. So they escalate it, let's get it over with. So whether it's fights or behavior or something that, that escalates it, that is a very common part of the tension building phase. And outside of a tension building phase, then, is it common to pick fights, to do things intentionally that the abuser doesn't like without there being tension in the air, knowing it's going to, or knowing or thinking it's going to provoke a reaction? 
I couldn't answer that. I, I would deal more in terms of the tension building because we don't know when it's occurring or when that person's feeling that I just need to get this over with. I just want it done. Just have one second, please. Yes. <clears throat> sure. You ever had uh, experience with victims uh, that were abused by people on steroids? <clears throat> yes. And I guess without getting too detailed, too in too specific. What is your experience with that? What is um, quite often victims relate that um, that there's been drug use and steroid is one of the common ones, um, and they are fearful, and that also kind of contributes to that hope springs eternal because they will often attribute the behavior. But we all know people that have either abused alcohol or drugs. Do they lower? The inhibitions, yes. Do they cause domestic violence? No. Steroids in particular, though, have something that's known as roid rage. Correct. Sudden fits of, of uh, sudden outbursts of you know, violence and, and such. Um, it, that's, different than, that's, that's different than in terms of causing domestic violence as compared to alcohol and uh, you know, alcohol and other drugs. Correct. correct. But then we're starting to get more into the medical, and that wouldn't be an area that I, I could answer. Is it consistent then that knowing someone that becomes violent, or knowing that someone becomes violent when using steroids, that the victim would help them use steroids, encourage them to use steroids? I couldn't answer that. Is it typical for the victim to make threats to the abuser? Yes. It's not uncommon in any relationship, you know, where there's some unhealthy exchanges. Um, and just because there's an abusive partner doesn't mean that that person won't exhibit some of the other behaviors that we see in, in unhealthy relationships. And uh, I, I, so then I'll, I'll ask the question more specifically and including threats of violence. Sure. I mean, that's, you know... Um, Not as common? Uh, you know what? I can't say that it's typical, but does it happen in relationships? Absolutely. Abusive and non-abusive relationships. typical that someone would be too scared to tell the police but not too scared to tell the whole world on Twitter or Instagram? Absolutely. Absolutely? Yes. One second, Your Honor. Yep. I'm um, no, pass the witness. Redirect? No, Your Honor, thank you. All right. Thank you, ma'am. We thank do you. appreciate your time. Okay, so uh, let's go ahead and break until 1.15. During this recess, you're admonished not to talk or convince.